Welcome to yet another episode of Build It With AI, where we dive deep into the world of artificial intelligence and the innovators shaping its future. I'm your host, Ishwara Srinivasan, also a senior AI advocate with Microsoft for Startups. And today we are exploring a crucial but overlooked aspect of AI development, which is understanding data quality that gets fed into your algorithms. Joining us is the founder of Clean Lab, a pioneering platform that solves this very data-centric issue with their data quality tools. Jonas is the co-founder and chief scientist at Clean Lab, which is the provider of this data-centric AI software that we're going to be talking about. Previously, he was a senior scientist at Amazon Web Services that powers application at hundreds of large companies. Before that, he completed his PhD at MIT, publishing over 30 papers in the top ML research venues and teaching first ever course on data-centric AI. Jonas started working on CleanLab as an open source project while he was still doing his PhD. And that translated into building a business value proposition and helping other organizations use this and develop a data-centric AI pipeline with their data quality at their organizations. So thank you so much for Jonas, um, for joining us. And I would love to hear more about your journey for building Clean Lab and where, where we have reached now. So Jonas, let's start at the beginning. We often hear that data is the fuel of AI. We all know that. But in your view, what made you build Clean Lab and how do you feel the quality of the data really fuels the impact of the engine that we're building? Yeah, so I guess I'll start with you know, the state of the industry today, which is that you see different companies producing, you know, very different quality machine learning solutions and AI solutions. And of course, we're all familiar with the companies that have produced some of the most popular and most strong performing AI solutions like OpenAI, Google, Mistral, Tesla. And what these companies really get right that a lot of people don't understand is that, yes, they do have a lot of really smart people at the company, but they are also just investing a huge amount of money into cleaning up these data sets and curating them to an extremely high degree of quality, such that the resulting you know, AI models that they are training and deploying on these data sets actually can be as reliable as is really needed to you know, make them as successful as they are. And so they're spending many millions of dollars on curating these data sets, getting them really well labeled, having you know multiple annotators review each other's work and multiple people responsible for curating the data sets. And most other companies, their AI solutions are just not nearly as good, to be frank. And the problem is they're just not doing this investment, not able to afford this investment as well. And really our goal with Clean Lab and with data centric AI is we think, you know, to make every other data set that exists out there as high quality, we need automation, we need software that can help do some of this work because there's just no way we're always going to have big teams of people, you know, cleaning up the, these big data sets and it's not super enjoyable work either. And so our mission is really to help every other company be able to produce such high quality AI solutions by providing the software and algorithms that automate a lot of the data cleanup work which spans you know, finding problems in your data set automatically to helping you edit the data and fix them at scale. And that's really the mission of our company. And we think AI has a lot to offer here. You know, Most people think about data feeding AI as like a one-way street, but we think, no, data, AI also can help you improve your data. And so that's the focus of our company is figuring out new ways to use AI to f discover problems in your data and help you fix them as quickly as possible so that even a small team or one individual can clean up a really big data set and get it high quality and then lead to success in your AI applications. That's, that's wonderful. I also know a little bit about how Clean Lab started. So I'm curious to hear from you and I want the audience to learn more about this as well. Clean Lab started as an open source project that you built while you were in grad school. So tell us a little more about that. Like, what did you observe? Like when you started building out this project, um, I, I believe like you started realizing that a lot of people used that GitHub repository that you had built together. And that's what made you build clean lab into a scalable product so tell us more about that yeah so our origin story 
uh, me and my two co-founders, Curtis and Nish, we were all just friends in grad school, um, you know, doing machine learning research as PhD students at MIT. And um, Curtis was actually working on the edX platform that MIT had just launched at that time and doing some data analysis um, and trying to detect who was cheating um, on that platform. And the first thing you'll realize, you know, if working on such a machine learning project is the quality of the labels of who's a cheater or not are highly noisy because you can never, you know, truly confirm or, you know, deny whether somebody really cheated or not. And so we were, you know, brainstorming different kinds of algorithms to figure out, you know, what data is noisy in these data sets. And so we ended up publishing some research on that, on just algorithms to find mislabeled data in a machine learning, you know, supervised learning data set. And um, we open sourced the code, you know, for that research paper. And that was an algorithm called Confident Learning. And the code for that research paper, uh, we made it a little nicer than other research code that you might find, mainly because we were presenting this at conferences and professors would tell us that they just didn't even believe this was possible, that you could take a machine learning model that was trained on noisy data and use that model to help you find what data was noisy in that same training set. And so we were like, we're not gonna argue with you about this. We're just gonna you know, make the code slightly better and you can go try it yourself and come to your own conclusions. Um, and so, yeah, we did that. And that library was called CleanLab because it helped you clean the labels of your data set. And over many years, it just started getting more and more adoption amongst companies like Google, Wells Fargo, other companies just were reaching out to us and asking, you know, like, are you going to build feature X, Y, Z? Um, can the library do this? Are you going to provide support? And we were just PhD students. So, you know, we tried to help a little bit, but not too much. And at the same time, I had graduated from my PhD and gone to work at Amazon Web Services in the meantime. Uh, really building a lot of the AutoML services that you know power most machine learning solutions in AWS today, and the the mission really was to enable software developers who are trying to incorporate machine learning in their apps to be able to you know achieve that without having machine learning expertise. And so we were building all these AutoML platforms and tools to enable this, and we saw that on the modeling side, software engineers were doing like a pretty good job of using our solutions and services when the data was like a tutorial data set or a famous benchmark data set. But then when they were trying to, you know, have impact in their company with the same code, they were just totally failing. And it wasn't their fault. Like it was just the data was super messed up in their real business applications. You know, some of those issues were like super obvious to any data scientist. Um, but these software engineers are just not trained at all. And other data issues were much more subtle and hard to detect. And so really over those, I worked there for four years and saw, you know, like if we're really going to make this impact of democratizing AI, we really need software that like not only helps the software engineers automate the modeling side, but also just tells them like what's wrong with their data set, why they shouldn't just, you know, blindly jump into trying all these machine learning models. And so really that coincided with our open source library really becoming quite popular and me and my co-founders, Curtis and Ish, got together uh, and decided to start this company. We thought, you know, hey, there's really this big appetite here for algorithms that can automatically find issues in data. And at that time, our open source library was just detecting one kind of issue, mislabeled data in a data set. And since then, we've really broadened that umbrella to just trying to use AI to detect and fix any kind of problem in any kind of data set, really. That's wonderful. And while you were mentioning about this, right, like something that caught my attention that when you were going to present this work to professors, it was very hard for them to believe that an algorithm can actually detect that, that there is noise in the data and how does it fix it, right? So with, with data quality, I think the biggest challenge is that it isn't 100% quantitative. There is a lot of aspect with data quality, which is qualitative as well. So it's very hard to define those standards and benchmarks on what is a good quality data versus what is a bad quality data. And as in when we drift away from numerical data into like text data, into video, into audio, I think that complexity keeps on increasing. So I'm curious to learn more about like 
how have you built this out with clean lab like how does it target these different kinds of data sets uh, what are the different kinds of metrics that you're using in order to like detect these kinds of data issues yeah so i guess the first thing i'll say is when it comes to data curation like we are an ai company we are trying to provide you know software that automates a lot of work as much as possible but we don't believe you know data curation itself is going to be something fully automated and so all of our software is designed to have a human in the loop such mm -hmm. that you know you're you as the uh, owner of the data set are the only person who knows where the data came from what exactly are you using the data for and you know the broader business implications of your application and really those that knowledge is absolutely crucial when it comes to data curation and you know determining what data is low quality or not really depends on the application in the end as well as where the data came from in the first place. And so we as a software product try and provide, you know, a bunch of quality measures and a bunch of estimations for you. But at the end of the day, we are not going to edit your data set for you. And we uh, provide suggestions on different kinds of data set edits that we propose based on, you know, what was algorithmically detected. But it's up to you as the human in the loop individual curating the data to actually, you know, execute those suggestions. And so half of like what we do is really user interface, user experience oriented work. Like we have a lot of designers at our company, which is you know not super typical for an AI startup. Um, and really, we think that's really a big part of the equation is enabling one person to digest the big data set, understand all the problems in it, and make edits to the data that you know actually move the needle on a big data set. So that's not just you know looking at data one at a time, but maybe making edits that impact millions of data points all at once. And those are really challenging user experience questions that we try and uh, really focus on. And then in terms of the data quality measures, um, I guess in traditional data quality software, which is probably what, you know, when most people think data quality, they're thinking of a very specific kind of tool already in their head. And these are mostly just for structured tabular data sets, first of all. And second of all, they're like really rules-based. So typically you as the data owner are responsible for uh, codifying different kinds of data quality rules of what is good or what is bad data yourself. You know, like this column can never have negative values and it can never have more missingness than 5% you know, missingness. And you just codify, you know, all the problems you think might appear in the data ahead of time. And then the data quality tool is just kind of running those rules against your data pipelines and flagging all the violations. Um, and so the way we think about data quality is very different, actually. It's much more exploratory. What we're trying to automate is more of the exploratory data analysis work, you know, that most data scientists have to do when given a big data set that might include images, it might include text, so a lot of unstructured data as well as potentially structured, you know, tabular data. And we want our AI system to just detect common types of issues that tend to occur in such data and alert you of them so that you get like way higher recall, you know, uh, across the different kinds of issues that might be in your data set. Like, you know, often you just won't have thought of this kind of issue in your data set, right? And so it's kind of like, uh, you can almost think of it like in, in the software world, like a linter, whereas, you know, traditional data quality software is like unit tests where you have to write all the tests yourself we're providing also like a default suite of you know checks for any data set that we just know tend to be super useful for most data sets. And so, you know, detecting things like anomalies and drift in the data and mislabeled data and ambiguous examples and duplicates, things like that. Maybe you just forgot to check your data set for that kind of issue. Uh, and we think there's a lot of value to be had there to just have this AI system that says, you know, by the way, I checked your data for these 20 different kinds of problems and, you know, found five of them. That just provides such a boost and makes data preparation so much more systematic, so much more, you know, uh, codified versus just ad hoc. Whatever I think of in the moment is what I'm going to check for. And, that's, you know, traditionally how this sort of data preparation works. Absolutely. I think that's wonderful. And you nailed it that, you know, when you start looking at data more from um, video, audio, or like textual uh, context, it becomes very dif difficult to um, extrapolate what data quality rules that you have for numerical data. 
So uh, I'm actually like curious to see if you have a demo that you can show to us because there's no better way to uh, see than really see it. So um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if you have any demo, that'll be wonderful for us to see. Yeah, certainly. Let's jump into the demo. Hopefully my screen is visible. Yep. So um, let's do an image data set because that's the most striking. And so, yeah, everything we do works for tabular text, uh, image data, and we also do some audio and video data too for big enterprise customers. And so what I'm showing here is our SaaS application, Clean Lab Studio, and it's a generally available application and pretty much you know anybody can go sign up to use it on our website. Uh, you just click this button and you'll get in and you'll have fun. And so here we're going to show uh, the ImageNet data set. So this is arguably you know, the most famous data set in all of machine learning history. Um, it's a really big data set. So like some of the screens might load a little slowly because yeah, this is a data set with millions, over a million images, uh, 1,000 classes in it. And you know, it's been studied by tens of thousands of academics. So many PhD dissertations have been written on it. And so much you know, work has been put into trying to improve machine learning on this data set by like 0.001%. Um, and so this data set, you know, is like a standard image classification data set where you have, you know, a bunch of images and classes. Uh, this is sorted by class, so maybe I'll jump through the data set in an effort to show more classes. Again, very big data set. Maybe I'll jump to the end here. Okay, here we go. The toilet paper class, lovely. But yeah, there's just a bunch of classes in this data set and just your standard image classification data set. And so we can, uh, the main operation you can do in CleanLab Studio is create a project. And the main thing I wanna emphasize here is that it's just super easy. There's like no configuration really. Um, so here, yeah, this is the image classification task. It's already been automatically detected that this is a multi-class uh, classification problem. Um, we specify, you know, which uh, label is gonna be, or which column of the data would be our class label. And then, um, we're just going to use our auto ML system in Clean Lab Studio. That's going to be this AI system that will find all these issues for you. And what the main thing to choose is whether we want to get results quickly um, and you know just have something to look at really quickly, or we want you know we're willing to wait longer and get higher quality results. And then we just click the Clean My Data button, and that will launch a project. And so that project, what will happen is our AI system will start training on your data. And we'll learn, you know, all the properties of your data set in order to diagnose different kinds of issues in your data set. And uh, once that project is done, you'll get an email and it'll be marked uh, ready for review in the application. And, you know, how long it takes will depend on whether you wanted to get better but higher quality results or you just wanted faster results. Um, and so once you get the results, uh, you'll jump into the project view and it'll look like this. And so here we'll have, uh, you know, different kind of issues uh, marked in our data set. And so the first thing I'll jump into is what we are most famous for, you know, what our uh, original company history, uh, like where we started as a company was around uh, developing these novel types of algorithms to automatically find mislabeled data in any data set. And so here we are looking at uh, label issues, which are the mislabeled data in this data set. And for example, here, like we have this uh, image that's labeled as fountain. Uh, but it should be geyser um, right there's another class and this is just what happens with a data set like this where you have a thousand classes the people labeling it like forget you know like what are even are the classes they try and do the best they can but there's just so many errors and this is like the highest quality data set i want to emphasize this many times that uh, you know like this data set has been studied by tens of thousands of academic researchers um, you know like there's no more studied data set in the world probably and um, still, you know, there's like so many obvious uh, errors in the data set, like this is not a tractor here. Um, there, this is labeled as a mask, but you know, it should be a ski mask because there's a ski mask class in the data set. Uh, this is not a shopping cart, it's a shop, or not a shopping basket, it's a shopping cart. And so our AI will also suggest when it detects, you know, something is mislabeled, it'll suggest, you know, a better label for the data point. And then you can also directly edit the data in the application uh, to fix its label. Um, so here, uh, I just fixed the label uh, by, oh, I chose the wrong action. I chose to keep the label, but we should actually choose to relabel it. Um, and so, yeah. 
and that will be the auto fix action here that will you know automatically uh, relabel that data point. And so I'm showing you now, you know, correcting data issues one at a time, but we can also uh, try and understand things a little more globally. Um, so here we're gonna jump into like understanding the label issues a little more globally in our data set. Um, so here, this is saying, uh, this chart is showing us that there is uh, a bunch of uh, examples with the given label projectile in the data set uh, that seem to be uh, mislabeled and specifically like 630 of them. And we can go down here and actually get a finer grain view and see that actually CleanLab Studio is suggesting, you know, the label missile is gonna be a better one for a lot of these projectile examples. And so we can, uh, 560 of them specifically, so we can jump in to see which ones those are. And so here we see, right, that this is like really vague, like are these projectiles, are these missiles? I don't really know. Um, like these are really hard examples, right, to deal with in the data set. We can also go uh, look at like uh, missile examples for reference, you know, like see what stuff is labeled missile in our data set. And as far as I can tell, right, like that's really hard to tell. And again, this is like one of the most famous machine learning data sets of all time. So the fact that, you know, you have these classes that it's like really impossible to even tell the difference is uh, not super great. And so maybe uh, for correcting this, maybe we want to just relabel all of these examples as a uh, uh, missile instead. And so we can uh, drag and drop and just select a bunch of them, maybe just the top 10, and uh, we could assign them all, say, the missile label and just fix you know, all 10 all at once. Alternatively, what you'll notice is each of these uh, data points is getting this label issue score, which is uh, quantifying, it's a numeric value that's quantifying like how confident is CleanLab that this data point is really mislabeled. And so we can, based on those scores, just apply an auto fix action to automatically you know, correct, say like the top 30 or the top 200 of these data points and automatically get them all relabeled. Um, and so, yeah, that will just uh, automatically relabel them such that they're no longer uh, visible in this uh, filtering uh, uh, view. But yeah, they'll all be fixed automatically to be labeled by the clean lab suggested action, which would have been missile for those examples. So hopefully that gives you a picture of how, you know, even a single data scientist using this application can just clean up millions of data points. And now let's jump into a few other types of issues that are automatically detected. Um, so in this data set, um, we also detect outliers, for example. So in ImageNet, uh, you know, those of you, you who are familiar, um, you may not be aware, there's all these like really weird examples that are just straight up, you know, like text type brochures in the data set that are actually, you know, super different than the examples. Uh, like, you know, most examples of the airship class, for example, are not going to, uh, you know, look like these brochures, right? Um, most examples of uh, television are not going to look like this. Uh, uh, just these all look like pieces of paper, basically. Most examples of eggnog, uh, where'd the eggnog go? Presumably are not going to, you know, be written material about eggnog. So we have all these outliers in the data set, which often uh, they're often indicating like uh, data source problems, right? Source problems in your data sources. Uh, maybe you want to reconsider what data sources you're using. Um, in CleanMap Studio, we might consider, you know, excluding some of these data points, but really it will depend on your application, whether these are bad data or good data that you want to like uh, specially handle. Also, we can handle uh, unlabeled data. Um, so, you know, like in this version of ImageNet, we actually just deleted 10 of the labels just to give you a sense of, you know, how this application can handle the unlabeled data. And you'll see the AI system has automatically uh, suggested labels for all these and we can immediately just get them auto-labeled. Maybe we only think, you know, the top seven of these based on the confidence score are trustworthy, um, and maybe the, the lower ones we find not trustworthy, so we can just auto-label the top seven of them, and voila, they'll all be now uh, labeled. So we'll see, you know, there's this corrected label that will have been applied to these examples. Um, and we can see a bunch of other issues, so we can see ambiguous examples. These are like, you know, examples where even if you have multiple annotators, they might not agree um, on these data points. And in this case, we see like the most ambiguous one tends to be these bird species that are really complicated 
in uh, ImageNet specifically to get right. Maybe you need an expert to annotate them. Maybe you need to refine your annotation instructions. Um, we can also detect a bunch of other issues like uh, nearly duplicated data or exact duplicates. And so you'll get a score. That's one if you know the data is exactly duplicated and uh, a little less than one when it's uh, near duplicates. I'm not sure if I have many good examples of near duplicates in ImageNet. I'm gonna jump many pages down. Let's see. Nope, we're still on exact duplicates here. But anyway, we can also find semantic near duplicates. You get the idea that like detecting all of these issues really required um, our AI system to understand your data, right? Like to detect outliers, to detect mislabeled data, to detect ambiguous data. This is like super different to detect not exact duplicates, but near duplicates. All of that requires actually semantically understanding the data and is just so different than traditional data quality software, which is all rules-based, it's all, you know, like simple map, simple code, essentially simple if else type statements. There's no like deep understanding of the data there. We can also detect, since this is an image data set, a bunch of like generic uh, problems that tend to occur in a lot of image data, like really dark images, uh, images that are maybe too bright or overexposed and hard to see, uh, images that are blurry, uh, you know, hard to uh, detect, you know, like especially you can imagine, say, this is like an e commerce product catalog or some kind of content catalog. You know, blurry images are not great to have as the main thing you're showing off. We can detect oddly sized images, uninformative images that don't have like a lot of uh, information content in them. Uh, we can detect, you know, weirdly uh, aspect ratio images and a bunch of other things that I'm not going to you know, jump into here. Um, but yeah, for different data sets, the set of different kinds of issues that will jump up and be notified that you'll be notified about will be totally different. And again, we did not say go look for, you know, near duplicates and dark issues, the AI system just automatically recognizes these problems in this data set. After we fix them, we can just click this export button, and get a cleaned version, uh, you know, whatever actions we did in the application, we'll get, we'll be able to export a version of the data set that exactly has those actions applied to it. And it'll look just like our original data set. So a really common workflow is if you're a machine learning team, you already have, you know, machine learning tech stack, you already have models in production. You can just use this tool to improve your data really quickly and then export exactly the same format of data and just plug it into your existing training pipeline, right? So you don't have to change anything about your existing modeling stack, which models you're using, what tools you're using, what deployment you're using, and you'll just get more reliable results with a better data set. And yeah, really the data improvements that we're making in this app are like super orthogonal to whatever kind of machine learning improvements you're exploring, whether that be changing, you know, the transformer architecture or the loss functions or other things. Alternatively, you can also deploy machine learning models directly in our app. Um, so like, you know, we did do pretty sophisticated machine learning automatically on your data set in order to be able to detect all these kinds of problems. And so when once you fix up your data set, it's now, you know, in some fixed state, we call it the clean set or short for clean data set. You can just click deploy model and it will retrain the same machine learning model auto ML system we originally used to find all these problems, but on the current state of your data set and it will be available behind a REST API for you to make uh, predictions directly. Or you can also, uh, for example, here, uh, make predictions in our web app for, you know, uh, business users or data analyst type users you can just pretty much drag and drop a file of test data and get the predictions. Uh, so yeah, we try to make everything super easy to use. And I think that uh, provides, you know, like a pretty good overview of the application in terms of the three pieces of value it contributes to most companies are around this automated quality assurance. You know, again, finding all these problems was like no work at all for me. And they were just automatically detected. Uh, B, after automated quality assurance, a lot of uh, the value people get is on improving a data set, whether that be for improving the data set to give you better machine learning results with your own machine learning models, or maybe you're just serving data directly, right? Like a lot of our customers are say like an e-commerce company who's serving a product catalog, maybe a law firm, like a data science team at a law firm, they're curating documents and there the data is the end product 
quality of that document curation, the quality of that product catalog is so important really, you know, directly influences the success of the company. Um, but also we do have, you know, many big machine learning teams as our customers who are trying to improve their machine learning models. And then finally, uh, the third piece of value is smaller, more understaffed machine learning teams or, you know, individual data scientists. We see this a lot, especially in like law firms and consulting mm -hmm. firms. There's like, you know, these two man, three man data science teams that are really understaffed. They don't have the models in production. They're taking too long. They're given too many tasks. And with our application, you can just really quickly go through the data prep and really quickly get a model deployed in production. That is a really good model. It can be like more accurate than a lot of uh, you know other machine learning solutions out there. I think that's, that's probably a good yeah. overview. That's that's wonderful. I think like what you've done with the product doesn't doesn't just like solve an engineering problem, but it introduces this interface which really democratizes how data quality can be distributed to other end users. Um, probably we're looking at a future where we have data quality specific roles where people are specializing in understanding, detecting, and uh, and resolving the issues that comes along with data. And you've provided with a very, very interactive interface that's going to help solve this backend of issues that comes with data quality. I just have one last question because I think you've covered a whole lot of topic and this is really, really helpful. And we saw it in, in practice and kudos to you for running a successful demo that most, most of the times doesn't work. So congratulations. I had a fast internet connection because yeah, image that can be really slow to load sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. So I just have one last question before we wrap up is uh, a lot of organizations, small or big, are on multi-cloud environments. They have some data which is hosted on different databases, some data which is proprietary needs to be uh, on-prem. So how does CleanLab integrate across these infrastructure? Like how does it work with multi-cloud environment? How does it work with uh, connecting with data sets that might have confidential proprietary information where we have to adhere to certain data privacy rules? Yeah, that's a great question and very timely. And I'd say there's a couple uh, ways that we think about that. One is we do uh, private deployments. Um, so especially for VPC uh, deployments where, um, you know, your data never leaves your firewall for a big enterprise and it's, you know, the same version of the SaaS application. And I think the supporting, uh, you know, infrastructure nowadays that the cloud providers provide to get these uh, VPC solutions set up is a lot more mature than it was a couple of years ago. It used to be a lot more painful. Um, so that's like the... Uh, number one option for big enterprises working with sensitive data. Uh, the second option that we uh, provide is a lot of these cloud marketplace uh, cloud uh, providers have marketplaces, and in the marketplaces they have uh, offerings for say machine learning uh, for specific kind of like API usage. So I should mention everything I demoed. I demoed like the no code version of the application where, you know, even a not sophisticated business user or a data analyst who hasn't written a lot of code can and clean up a big data set. But everything we do is also available via APIs for more programmatic incorporation in your workflows. And so all of those APIs we offer also through these marketplaces um, and for big enterprises, you know, who are working in a specific cloud or in Databricks, um, we can offer a uh, marketplace solution to use those APIs directly. And those marketplace solutions, the cloud provider provides a ton of guarantees on security, safety, privacy, like we're all not connected to the internet or anything like that. They don't persist anything. And that's all, you know, based on you trusting your cloud provider. So I hope it was very helpful for you to learn about what Clean Lab is doing and how founders like Jonas is able to build these technologies that are going to really change the way organizations are operating with their data. If you are somebody who's an entrepreneur, work at a startup, or you believe that you have this idea that's going to change how AI is used in future applications, <laughs> then you definitely should be looking ahead with Founders Hub. This is one of the initiatives from Microsoft for Startups where we're giving this platform to startups and to founders so that they can start building their first prototype. 
whether you are in your ideation phase or you have your minimum viable solution or you are looking at a scalable product, we can help you in all of these different stages. And there's a lot of credits that's given to founders. There is a lot of other benefits with respect to third party tools, with one on one advisory that we're offering to founders, etc. So definitely check out Founders Hub if you haven't already. And if you know of a startup founder who would benefit from this, definitely share this with them.